Mr. Russell Barini is up. He is Senior Enterprise Architect <laughs> for Healthways. That's real important. International yeah. Health Management Company based in Franklin, Tennessee, where he conducts all internal penetration and web application testing for large assortment of web applications. Over the last 12 years, as an IT firm, he has accrued many paper certifications that are quickly becoming obsolete, like the Windows 2000 MCSE. Yeah, Windows 2000! Hey, me too! Yeah! <laughs> and one really cool Sans G Pen cert. So, the one here is Mr. Russell Murray. <laughs> How's it going? Alright, so if we're any confusion, if you listen to me talk for about the last four seconds, you realize I'm not local. I am in Tennessee, like Mike said. And I'm not Jeff Foxworthy, which is the lady at the hotel that I was last night. I show up, I come to check in, I say, oh, I need to check in my room. Oh my god, I love Jeff Foxworthy. Okay, you know. Okay, everybody in Tennessee loves Jeff Foxworthy, I guess. So, um, good to talk today about the network cache storage. I've run into a lot of it on some of the uh, penetration testing I've done. Uh, I handle all our internal pen testing, all our internal vulnerability management, and um, yeah, so I'll talk about some of the things I found that are interesting, and I think these devices are really interesting, they're a lot of fun too when you're testing because you get to use, there's web app stuff, there's protocol fuzzing, there's just drop and exploits, and then there's just the dumb misconfiguration stuff, and almost always you can get something valuable to put in your pen test report from network cache storage. So, and you can also use it to gather other information about the network, uh, around profiling, kind of what's on the network, things like that. So, here's the obligatory who am I slide. Uh, I write this and realize, gosh, I'm really, really boring. I have no relation to pirates, ninjas, I don't take karate, I don't do any of that stuff. Uh, but I do contract penetration testing on the side, and I am a, I do all the internal penetration testing at Healthways, where we have, seem to buy a company every other week, first thing we do, go run an internal pen test. Uh, I used to teach computer network systems and InfoSec stuff at uh, a three-letter for-profit school at UCF has on TV a lot with some people who's turned their lives around, but we can talk about that somewhere else. Uh, <laughs> I wrote the uh, U3 Incident Response Switch Lay, which I presented at Freaknik down in Nashville in 2008. Um, if you guys follow Hack5, you might have seen some stuff on the forums about that. Uh, I also wrote an article called Denial of Service 2.0 using QoS tagging and IPS flag listing. In denial of service, that was in a couple of magazines. And um, don't know anything about storage, I can spell it on if you ask me, and I think real hard for a little bit. Uh, but, um, and then lastly, I have a complete lack of any PowerPoint skills. It would be the worst slide you've ever seen. So, uh, <laughs> they'll be straight black and white. You know, but, uh, that's all right. So, let's see. All right, so typical pen test. I think I skipped it. Yeah, there we go. Typical pen test. So, we run this thing, open interpreter shells. We correct passwords, and that is a real screenshot. We did find a server with that many passwords that were password one, uh, which is awesome. Uh, do some web app stuff, some SQL injection. So the two problems with that is these things involve work. I'm lazy. So, uh, you know, that was the best joke in the whole presentation. It's all that built from here. Uh, so so uh, anyway, solve the problem. Uh, attack the network, the network cache storage where all these data is, steal the data, and spend the rest of the project on more constructive pursuits like that. So, <laughs> yeah. So, quick, quick outline we're going to talk about. Why, why do we target storage? Why do we like it? Um, find devices on the network. How do you find them? We have different levels of access. Obviously, we can do straight in map if we have that kind of access, but if we don't, what are some other ways to find where network cache storage is in use? Uh, cheesy exploits with examples of some of my favorites. Um, and then, we're going to talk about network profiling using storage appliances. Because even if you find a device that's locked down, there are still some things that are inherently exposed on storage that you can use on a test that will help you gather other information about what's on the network. And then, I'll show a tool I wrote, which is really not fancy at all, called NASNUM. It's a, you go and you can run against a piece of storage and it'll gather data for, about what's open on it, what's exposed, what's, what's out there for you. So, Let's see, storage is a target. We like it, widely used, lots of space, $2,500, you can add five terabytes, 10 terabytes of cache storage. And we also want, when you're in business, OS licenses are freaking expensive. I don't know if any of you have noticed that, but you typically want, if you buy a Windows license, a Red Hat license, whatever, it to do stuff, like run app tiers, host websites, you know, databases, all that stuff. And you really don't want to waste money on an OS license to 
have somewhere people throw the, their word docs or the illegal movie and music share that the company has floating around. Not that we've ever found one of those where I work, but uh, <laughs> you, generally you don't want to burn, uh, you don't want to burn up OS licensing on that. So you get this really cheap storage running some little firmware that's usually bad Linux or, or something else, and you put it on network and you get a lot of space. Uh, let's see, it, you know, it's, it frequently has a sensitive data. A lot of people also back up to it. And when you back up, you have very lax permissions to tell you want to get the stuff when everything's down, right? And um, it's got a lot of stuff turned on by default. And uh, if you hit a VMware environment, you'll find there's a lot of network attached storage from a particular company. Hopefully nobody's here from there since they're real headquarters is real close. Uh, but uh, eat more chicken, take the first letters of that, and that'll tell you what you have. So, <laughs> yeah, they like to sell VMware storage. So, uh, let's see here. Okay, so sort of, sort of com comparing uh, a traditional file server and network patch storage. Um, on a traditional file server, admin specifies what's on and off. This obviously has gotten better recent year. It used to be everything was on now. Uh, some of the newer built windows and things like that. It's, you have to, there's lots of things off by default. You have to turn them on. Patch storage, lots of things on by default. Um, typically, on a traditional file server, now you have a more restrictive default permission model. Attached storage is designed to be available. So you throw a network plug in, it's ready to go, right? Um, traditional, yeah, traditional file server, we can roll into Windows patching, whatever, Red Hat patching, Linux patching, that kind of thing. Usually storage uh, is something proprietary, something that you try not to touch because if you're using it for VMware or other things, if you brick it, you will be finding another job. So, uh, <laughs> Yeah, so, and the typical admin, typically, if you go through, say, an MCSE class or you become an administrator on some platform, they'll teach, and that will share files, they'll teach you how to share files and do it properly. Doesn't mean they always do, but they teach it to you. But if you buy a lot of EMC, HP, Dell, higher end storage stuff, then uh, you have to hire people who know it, and maybe you don't, your company's cheap and doesn't do that, and you tell the guy, hey, go watch these. Uh, CPD nuggets on how to administer storage, and then um, you wind up with storage better. Okay. Okay. So finding attached storage on the network, um, it, it can be a little bit tricky. Like I said, we can do operating system uh, or in that rather, and we can do you know OS detection, service versioning, things like that. But if you don't have that, and you look at this. It really doesn't look like much of anything. It looks like maybe a Linux server that somebody burned a bunch of stuff on. There's SSH, there's FTP, there's probably some kind of Apache web server running, you know, SSL, and that kind of thing. Um, so, depending on what little access you have, how do you find the stuff on the network? Method one, grab a Mac. Okay, so again, this is, I think I copied and pasted it from the last slide, honestly. But the Mac address is EMC, and we know that, which can be good because we know EMC makes storage, but it also can be bad because EMC also makes a lot of other crap right now. So this could really could be some other type of device. We have to do some more, more investigating, and depending on what kind of engagement you're on, how noisy you're allowed to be, you may or may not be able to, um, to, to do that kind of uh, testing. And again, if you're, in a, if you're in an environment where you're looking at a piece of storage, and you do something that brings the storage down in the middle of the business day, that can be bad. So, <laughs> so let's see here. Okay, so banner and certificate grabbing. Some, uh, some storage is very, very nice. EMC on every protocol that they have will tell you exactly that it's EMC, and this is the software, and this is the revision, which is awesome, because then you can look for vulnerabilities in it, and they've had like 18 in 2013 so far. Uh, but other storage, this is from another vendor, it just says FTP server ready. But then when we go look at the same vendor, this is Buffalo, and you can tell, with the same vendor, and we actually grab the SSL certificate off of it, we see, oh, Buffalo, oh, you guys, all right, we figure out this piece of patch storage on the network without being particularly noisy or running, you know, port scans, things like that. If you have graphical access, you can find this is fairly self explanatory. You can find management consoles for things, which probably have the default username or password. Um, you can find SIFS comments and SIFS shares. So if you look at that, you see that's EMC SNAS. Once again, EMC, I'm very proud. They like to mark it. That's just EMC stuff on the network. And I'll tell you where it is. And then this is pretty cool. Uh, if you had just been sniffing network traffic, uh, a lot of these clients 
And it's not always a client that necessarily is directly related to the attached storage, but it might be related to some function that it provides, like backup. We'll um, use broadcast and multicast traffic to find the uh, storage on the network. So this actually comes from Buffalo NAS Navigator, which is awesome. They have this little, this little client that runs on your machine where you click and it says, tell me where all the storage is and all the shares on it. And if you look, it goes broadcast and then network broadcast to find it, which is great because then you write a little program that says, I'm so-and-so, and yeah, I'm the storage, sure. Send me your AD username and password. And um, <laughs> that actually does work. I'm working on something on that right now that I didn't get ready in time for this. But uh, yeah, so that's pretty cool. Um, I didn't understand. I, I put some of this in. It was very cheap. And I was like, oh, it was in. Throw in the data center. I couldn't figure out why my thing couldn't find it. And then my NAS navigator. And then I called him and said, oh, yeah, it's got the same deal. I said, why? Well, it just does. Okay, yeah. Anyway, that came back out. So now what? Found storage, what do we do with it? Okay. Sort of hard stuff, sometimes hard, sometimes not. Exploit services, exploit device firmware. Uh, and, and when I say firmware, that includes, you know, management consoles, things like that, like to the next point. And then exploit software running on the network the device uses. And that's what I was talking about with, you know, maybe the NAS navigator and some of these backup agents. And we'll get to a little more of each of these things. Um, the easy stuff that almost always works is steal data across misconfigured services, open file shares, um, open uh, NFS shares, uh, find hosts which are granted privilege access to focus your packs on. So that's what I was talking about network profiling. How many people are fairly familiar with NFS? Okay. What happens if you go show mount dash E to an NFS share? Who knows? We'll take a look. If you have NFS products on a Linux distribution and you have and you use show mount dash e, here's all the IP storage. Okay. Basically, it tells you who the clients are. Yeah, it tells you who all the clients are, right? So if I had an NFS mount and I know these hosts can get to this thing on the network, but nobody else can, who do I want to attack first? Okay. And uh, let's see, yeah, applying host of live connections to make reasonable guesses at their operating system scenario pack service. And so one thing I think is particularly interesting about um, storage, file sharing protocols is if we're looking at connections to a server, say, you know, it's FTP, so you've got a bunch of SNMP data, and you say, oh, guys, see a bunch of FTP connections. That could be any OS, web connection from Germany, any OS. Now, that's generally true of storage, but if you're on an enterprise and you see a connection, to a uh, SMB or SIF share, what's generally the client OS? That was done Windows. Windows. You see an NFS connection, what's generally the OS? It's a Unix. Unix, Linux. Now, you could do it, obviously, you can connect it as SIF shares with Linux, you can connect it as uh, NFS shares with Windows, but, you know, really, I mean, what are the odds that somebody's going to be doing that most of the time? Yeah, very, very small, right? Because that involves work. <laughs> uh, so, uh, let's see. Okay, so that's one services. So, like I said before, badly rolled Linux firmware pretty prevalent in these devices. Uh, this is not a talk on how to use Google to find exploits or run, you know, uh, run Metasploit shells or anything like that. Uh, the tips I have from experience doing it is you can shell these devices, try lots of payloads, try the same payload do it multiple times, and you'll be surprised what works and what doesn't. Um, these are typically some kind of firmware-based device. Now, you can buy storage. I think HP sells some where Windows is the OS, host OS, or, you know, or some, they have a, a, a Windows storage edition or something like that. It's a special flavor of Windows. But typically your large scale storage with some of these generic off the shelf devices is Linux, BSD, with Samba, and free FTP, and open SSL, and things like that for uh, um, attaching to the network. So uh, don't you know, try lots of payloads. Don't go after on the box credentials. They're pretty much useless because you know, maybe you can log into the box and do something, but you're probably going to get caught. Uh, and the data is usually all uh, directly accessible from the file system. I'll show you an example of that. Um, tread lightly. Again, like I talked about before, if you bring down storage, it has all the production system virtual disk files on it uncleanly during business hours. You get a one-way ticket home. Um, I, I know this because somebody did this not on a pen test, but just doing something stupid on some uh, EMC storage one night while I was in uh, St. Louis, and I'm not welcome back at the uh, uh, Hilton there in St. Louis anymore. Uh, so uh, after after you know being on the phone in the hall yelling and swearing for 12 hours, they generally don't like you to come back to the hotel. So uh, 
All right, let's see here. So this is kind of a typical example, and I mean, this is basic stuff. This is uh, running an exploit. I forget the vendor of this particular storage device. If I remember correctly, they're actually bankrupt now. Uh, but it's on pen test, open the shell, and uh, the shell itself is not that interesting, but what is interesting is that when you get and you look at the permissions on all the files, right, <laughs> is it was like that. So all the permission enforcement was being done through the services that are on the box. So if you can break outside the context of the services and access the file system directly or outside the services, and it doesn't really matter. I mean, I don't know what user account I have on this, but it wasn't like rude or anything like that. It was some lower privilege service account. Then you get, you still get whatever you want because all the permissions are being enforced through services. Wow. Yeah. So. Uh, let's see, exploiting firmware and device management. Uh, this is another cool one. So most of these, uh, these are smaller devices. The larger devices you generally have a um, web console or a separate management console or server for. But small scale devices, you have a web console built in. Uh, these things are vulnerable to pretty much the same types of things that uh, your typical router firmware stuff is, is badly written. Cross-site scripting, command injection, authentication bypasses, and arbitrary file downloads which is great for storage because, like we just talked about, if you can download files from the storage through the web console, then you're going outside the context of those services again, and you can download whatever you want. Um, again, same tips, don't waste time on on-box credentials and don't bring the storage down. Uh, so, a simple example, uh, this, was on, this is for Buffalo Care Station NAS devices. This was actually just fixed in firmware release three months ago, I think. Um, I, I pick a lot of care station and EMC because those are the two things we have the most of in our environment that um, I run in five or six different devices with similar types of problems to these. So um, you can find, if you're interested, you can find the exploit here. Um, let's see if that shows up. Not real well, but if you look in the address bar up there at the top, then you can call this page with no authentication. Uh, it's a it's a Perl script and it will go get any file on the file system for you, which is awesome. There's also a second exploit, I have the documentation here, where you can change a post request into the application to run any command on the system. But really, I mean, you can create yourself an admin user, reset admin password or whatever, but if you can do this, why would you really want to do anything else, right? So, um, let's see. Uh, simple example two, unauthorized access to root NFS export on EMC Solera, like big time file shares. Uh, but um, I thought, I found this, I was like, man, this is cool. Did the, you know, listen to the NFS exports, found these IPs, and I was like, man, this is awesome, I'm going to turn this in, and then I found out somebody already found it in 2010. Whoops. <laughs> so, uh, so it was a firmware attack and in bonehead internal configuration. They had these IPs that are owned by EMC, and you actually put them in, you know, RN or something like that, and you can see that they're owned by EMC, and they're used for internal box communication, uh, but the, uh, it, if you look, the root of the file system is exposed to those IPs. So what happens if somebody gets in the switch, adds that VLAN or something like that, and the subnet's injected into the network? It's root. Now this is not root OS access, this is root of your file shares, which is still all your file shares, and that's probably bad, right? So, uh, let's see here. Okay, supplemental software, let me talk about it. You get a lot of um, third-party software, let's see how I'm doing. Time here. There's really not too much. I'm trying to go fast because I know I'm the last talk today, and you know, we've had a lot of awesome here. Uh, but uh, uh, storage vendors love self package stuff, whether it's backup software, deduplication software, things like that. Um, and sometimes you can do interesting things attacking this complementary software. It's also safer to do because you're uh, targeting one system instead of the entire storage array, and you don't have to worry about bringing everything down, right? Um, so if you fingerprint storage, like if you find a bunch of HP stores, you might find something like HP data protectors running. Uh, there's also, if you fingerprint EMC storage, you can find a lot of supplemental EMC software that's available on the network. Uh, it is, like I said, it's lower risk than kind of whacking away at storage and hoping you don't crash it. And uh, there's the link uh, for the uh, EMC customers. Uh, they've got a ton of CVEs out on a lot of their storage related products and uh, in the past two years has been Tons and tons of stuff. I would go look there and make sure. I just made our storage team upgrade to everything because uh, when we started practicing this stuff, we found we were running almost all of it. Because it's the kind of stuff that, as long as it just sort of runs, you patch it, right? It, it's doing what it's supposed to do and nobody thinks about it. It's not something, it's something that if it stops doing what it's supposed to do, then that's 
probably bad. So, let's see. Okay, this is one of my favorites. HP Data Protector Remote Command Execution. There is an SLA module available for it, which is cool. And one of the things that's awesome that came out since I wrote these slides is this was a version 6 vulnerability, and they patched it, and then it, the same vulnerability has been discovered in version 7. Uh, and just reported three days ago. So, uh, yeah, so that, that works great. There's a link to it. Um, you can remotely execute commands over a network system with no authentication, uh, which is really cool. Uh, so there you see, that's probably hard to see, but you see there's the, the uh, backup client service, which you typically get if you buy some HP storage. Uh, it's running as local system. So you use Metasploit module, you send it commands. I told it to go run calculator, uh, which is just, I think it's just wrong to run calculator system for some reason, but um, maybe that's just me. Uh, and there you go, calculator system. <laughs> so, but, Obviously, that's a fairly benign example, but you could run other things as well uh, and, and do worse stuff than launching calculator. However, this was the middle of the business day. So. Uh, let's see here. What else? Network profiling. So, kind of what we were just talking about. Even if the storage is relatively secure, it tends to leak a lot of information about what's on your network and how data is stored is not configured properly. So, known protocols that, that the device is using is really, really, really a good way to figure out what's on the network and passively fingerprint everything out on the network without scanning things. So when you have uh, NFS running, you typically get the RPC bind and mount services, which will puke up NFS ACLs and um, a list of the share exports to everybody, and devices up on the network. Um, SMB CIFS browsing, you can see share names. Now, one thing I would say, and like I was talking about, uh, these are usually really, really badly rolled firmware-based devices. And I found some of the SMB tools uh, in you know, your favorite security testing distribution, PackFrag, Kali, whatever you're using now, kind of late, don't always work right. Um, so, uh, and we'll see some of that in a minute because I managed to break something last night in my demo uh, and I haven't fixed it yet. Uh, and then SMP, if you have changed your SMP strings and you guess it's something like, oh, I don't know, public, uh, then you see, uh, you can see established connections, the port numbers, and protocols, and then take that data and try to correlate it to, um, you know, some of these other things we talked about. Uh, so, you know, port, port 445, that is what protocol? Nobody know? CIS, CIS or SMB, uh, TCP 2049? NFS, yep. Right, so if I can see from SNMP a bunch of established connections to those ports, then I can actually make uh, good guesses of what's out on the network and where it is. So uh, show mount is your friend. Uh, it's available in Linux and Windows. I actually just learned that. Uh, Server 2008 R2 has uh, these, it may be 2003, and I know 2012 as well has it, uh, that you can actually install NFS services uh, for Windows, or Unix services for Windows, I mean it's called. Uh, but, uh, and you get these commands. So uh, show mount dash, dash e will get you the list of exports and ACLs from a piece of storage or, and I say storage sort of generically, this is typically found on attached storage, but if this was some kind of Linux server or some kind of real operating system server, same techniques would work. Um, but most of the things we talk about in this talk are related to uh, attached storage devices. Uh, show mount dash a said, we'll show you who's connected to the export, so I'll show you live connections. The thing that I did learn, uh, if you go read the man page for this, is, which is really funny, it actually says on the dash A option, this is an actor, never use this. So why do you have it in the, in the packet? I don't know. But uh, what, what I figured out it does is it, it just, if somebody disconnects, it won't purge the connection out of the list you get back. So if you get an old connection, sometimes it'll show you some hosts that maybe not, are not connected on the network anymore. Okay, um, NFS ACLs are IP based typically, so if you see an ACL, you see IPs, what we talk about, these are the hosts we want to go get first. And um, yeah, so quick example of showing that sheet. You see this actually came from some EMC storage, so you see those root ones. Okay, you see these are three, we have three shares that have no uh, ACLs applied to them at all. Let's go see what's in those. And then we have the shared juicy secret stuff, which is has a whole bunch of posts that can get at it, so I'll probably want to get those because they can get to the secret stuff, right? Um, show mount SA, here's the, the allegedly flawed show mount SA, but it will actually show you sort of the same concept. Here's a host, here's what share it's connected to. So, 
Uh, okay, as to being CFS, I found her a little trickier because the implementations on storage just aren't pure. And when I try to run some of the tools uh, you built, you know, come with the pen test distribution, you, you get a lot of errors. Uh, you don't always use the same commands to log into them. It, it's really sort of odd. Shared enumeration will a lot of times crash and burn. But typically, if you're going some Linux pen test distribution to Samba, it works good. But if you're going to other stuff, it doesn't work so much. Um, typically, if you have SMB client or the SIPS utils package, it'll show you. But if you do want to try to enumerate shares on storage, command SMB client shl. And you can also give it credentials if you have a set of credentials. But the way I've approached storage auditing always is let's see what can happen without uh, credentials and see how bad it is. Okay, let's see. So sample SMB client, this was all gathered without credentials, uh, which is pretty cool because you can see the version of Samba running, possibly vulnerable. You can see different things. This is all stuff that's off our network now, don't get too excited. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I retired all this. But and you can see that you can see the vendor of the storage, and you can also see uh, if it's you have devices in a work group or a domain setup, it will actually show you other devices on the network as well. Just like network neighborhood and windows. Yeah. Particularly useful here is that you'll find your domain controller because that's often a very juicy target. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And yes, you could use this. And again, this is a lot of, um, there's exploitation stuff, but there's just a lot of information gathering you can do off storage as well. So, uh, let's see here. Storage SNMP. We talked about protocols. We skipped your pop quiz and let's fall on skip and drink ticket away. I, I really should have told them to get more tickets away so if this goes really bad, then you guys will forget. But, uh, yeah, so uh, let's see. Um, with file sharing protocols, it's much easier to make a logical guess at the operating system, particularly if you correlate with other data on the network. Like your example, if you've already found the domain controller, I see a bunch of machines connected to CFs or SMB shares, then I kind of know what's, um, what's out on the network. Um, so there's an SMB MIB called TCP con state, and it will show you basically every live TCP connection. On the uh, to a device, um, and I've got this works. I've tried three different storage vendors, and all all three of those uh, this has worked good on. On FreeNAS, it does not work. Uh, so apparently, the MIB is called something different in BSD than whatever those vendors are using. So um, so you can make some logical guesses about vulnerable services, what's in use of the network, that kind of thing. All right. So um, sample SMP walk, just using public community screen. You see. Here's a bunch of stuff attached to port 445. We can probably guess these are Windows hosts of some sort. Easy enough, right? This is all, there's nothing that's real rocket science here. This is all taking fairly common sense stuff that we would use in other, on other types of devices or another piece of our engagement and putting it all for one device. Hey, hey, sir, what's up? Can you go back to the previous slide? Yes, sir. Now, did you obfuscate those internal IP addresses? That subject is gone. <laughs> you, you cannot cheat on the pen test this year. <laughs> Just check it. You can use the previous year's data from when you got in, but uh, uh, you know, that office is closed. Uh, so getting to NASNUM, which is a quick, ugly, ugly batch script I wrote to go after low-hanging fruit on NAS devices. Um, it's on GitHub. If you guys think it will be useful, I'm going to show it to you what it does. Uh, I would really like so somebody can take it and make it better. I told you I'm lazy, so what I do is I just put code on GitHub and let other people write it for me as part of the social experience or whatever it's called now. So, um, so do all the storage auditing for me and create a slightly better, pathetic looking HTML report. Uh, it's it's done, it works, and I'll show it to you, but feel free to download it, fork it, make it good, make it nice. Uh, and depending on what kind of testing you want to do, you'll need NFS procs, NCFTP, which is a uh, quick little scripted FTP editor and SNMP to run all the tests. And let's see if this demo will blow up for me. Okay. So. That is the worst. And you see, I have a folder called When the Demo Goes Bad. So if this goes uh, horrifically south, then uh, we'll be set. But so we have that. We have Kali Linux. And we have somewhere back here a, a free NAS uh, with a lot of stuff turned on and configured very badly on it. So 
Just so everyone knows, there's four beers left on the table. So I'm gonna drink all four. Beers. Drink all of them for the demo, please. Uh, <laughs> I thought this would be yeah. a good time. Yeah, this is an excellent time. Uh, so, so, uh, so real quick, also, there we go. Okay, so NASNOM, the network cache storage enumerator. NASNOM, the IP, the output file, and then the stuff you want to do. Grab the SN SNMP info, grab NFS, check SNMP for connection data, and uh, check for anonymous FTP, because I think I find a lot of these devices that FTP is enabled. And um, one of the things that dash S and dash N will do is it will actually mount the shares and enumerate the files there. Uh, so there's an option if you don't want to do that, then you can turn that off. And then also at least I have a bunch of stuff turned on as far as it writing some output files just for debug purposes, and there's an option to erase those uh, at the end. So um, I have to remember what the IP of this other one was. There we go. Okay, 172. Somebody remember that. Uh, 172.16.64.129. I will probably type this badly one handed. Let me make sure. I, I thought you had a good practice at that. <laughs> yeah. I have no comment. <laughs> Speaking of which, the wireless at the hotel is really bad. Uh, and there were no good movies on the pay per view, so uh, don't stay in the billboard. Uh, okay, and then we'll clear it. Besides, uh, HTM. Why not? Uh, and then let's just. Uh, SMB will sort of work, so we'll do that. Uh, NFS, um, SNMP does not work, and we'll still, I'll tell you that right now, but I think I showed you some, I can show you some sample output where SNMP did work. And then, so we'll try, grab SNMP, SMB info, grab NFS info, and then we'll uh, check for anonymous FTP and new files, and this should run super fast. S, uh, the SMB client, uh, you have to type in the, you, well, okay, let me qualify that. By default, you have to type in the uh, system password, um, but you can change that, and on this VM, I didn't fix that before. So, all right, we'll have to type in this awful password with one hand again. Let's see here. Okay. Yeah, you see, so actually mounting the SM SMB shares blew up, which for some reason, I wrote that last night, and I don't remember why. So, easy enough, done. All right, and then. What did I call the output? B sides that HDM. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So store dot report tells you when you started, when you finished. There's a list of the shares. As you see, this guy had uh, credit cards with all their credit card data on it uh, as an open share. Uh, there's the SMP or the NFS shares rather. Uh, so you see, the databases are on uh, restricted to this subnet. Admin stuff, uh, they didn't put a share on it. And I find this a lot. I uh, say share on ACL. Uh, but I find this a lot where they will write the most pristine, beautiful um, SIFS ACL and audit friendly, minimum permissions, everything. But then some Linux server needs to get to it, so they turn on NFS and leave it like this. <laughs> so uh, I've seen that like a whole bunch. Uh, and then uh, virtual disks, and here's some hosts, and we can say, sort of, we correlate, well, this is called virtual disk. Here's the host to get to it. These are probably VMware hosts, right? Um, and then it goes through and just lists out the directory for the ones that could mount. Basically, it'll look through and anybody it finds, or anywhere it finds an, uh, everyone or an asterisk in the uh, NFS ACL, it'll mount it up and it will enumerate all the files in it. So, I, I, some of this is very tongue in cheek, but these guys have text file all the network passwords of text. Um, which is great on their admin stuff share. Uh, and then the uh, anonymous uh, FTP work. Um, and I didn't enumerate most blank. I should have actually mounted a share up to show you that it will enumerate host. But um, uh, anonymous FTP, we had the embarrassing CEO secret stuff text uh, sitting out there now. So uh, that is NASM. Like I said, if, if you guys think it is useful, please take it, make it really good, you know, because right now it's just something I wrote very quickly to give our storage guys to stop off from doing dumb things, but, um, you know, it works. And you can obviously do, if you want to roll this stuff in to um, regular auditing, uh, Nessus has templates for all this. Paul, where are you? I'm giving you, oh, I'm giving you a plug, okay. 
Hey, yeah, 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 and I and I do actually have some storage specific audit templates that will do all this for you, but um, I don't give everybody access to Nessus in our network for various reasons. We outsource a lot of our IT, and that's all I'll say about that. Um, but uh, yeah, so um, what's left? I don't really remember. Okay, yeah, I think that's it right there. All right, slideshow. Okay, so. To-do list, uh, things I'd like to add to this, add a subnet calculator to mount up the NFS shares if you're running it from a machine that's in uh, an uh, IP that's in an NFS ACL. Uh, clean up the very, very sad SMB handling and add credentials for it. Uh, create prettier HTML reports because my background is network and infrastructure and off-writing HTML and as you can see, the output of that was pretty grotesque. Very efficient, very clean, efficient. Okay. I okay. Like HTML in the 90s and I stuck with it. Good. That's, well, you know. That's, I was going to put some Facebook like buttons in there, but I thought that might work well. But uh, uh, and so, so a lot of these devices now have uh, some sort of web based uh, file share par parsing or uh, file shares um, where you go to a web page and you can open a file from it. And so I'd like to do that, uh, but I need to find some more sample devices because. Unfortunately, this is not one of those things I can buy for 25 bucks like, like the last guy. This is like I have to drop a couple thousand dollars into a device to test it. But uh, some of them are really nice and will run their firmware on VMware. You just have to find it on the Pirate Bay or something like that. Uh, so um, that's dynamic service detection. I'd like to uh, maybe add where, you know, instead of saying I want to try to test for this, 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 let's let NMAP scan for these ports and based on what it finds open, put that in the report. And then uh, screenshot web management consoles, because I think they're very relevant to uh, make sure that you have changed the default username and password, things like that. I started to write something more elaborate Ruby, and um, then I realized I was pretty much reinventing the wheel. Everything I needed was in um, was already in Bash and stuff other people had written, so being lazy, I just borrowed off their stuff. So um, let's see, questions, comments, cuss words. Uh, you can send them to me here. Uh, I'm not cool enough to do Twitter, so if you saw the title of this talk, it was like 200 characters long, so I can't say anything uh, in that few uh, characters. So, uh, But you're welcome to email me. The code is here. Fork it. Play with it. And uh, thanks to Paul.com and besides for having me to speak. Questions? <laughs> Oh, I knew we should give it up for this guy for coming so far, too. I was complaining about coming from Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> if there's any questions, we can, you know. Yeah. I have one. I'm not too familiar, familiar with the area, but when, uh, yeah. when these uh, manufacturers release an update, do they describe the security implications of the update, or do they just more talk about you know, this new functionality, but not talk about what they're patching? So uh, I've seen it both ways. Uh, Repeat so, the question. Oh, I'm sorry. So the question was, do manufacturers describe the um, security implications of an update, say we fix this, 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 versus do they just talk about new functionality that's included in an update? And um, I've seen it both ways. So with EMC, they're very good. They, they have CVEs, and they say we address the CVE, the CVE, the CVE. Um, with um, some of the Terran Station stuff and some of the other vendors, I see fixed security issue in the note, but it doesn't tell you what it is. One thing that's interesting, I showed that one uh, issue with the Buffalo uh, stuff that was just fixed, and uh, in the fix they released, they patched two and introduced three. Uh, and I'm working with them on those three, so I'm not going to say what they are right now. But uh, yeah, so I mean, it just depends on the vendor. A lot of these devices are really cheap off-the-shelf devices, uh, particularly uh, for the more SMB targeted. Um, generally, with EMC, if you buy a quarter million dollar storage array, they'll come install it for you and hug you and take you to lunch. But uh, uh, yeah, anyway, uh, so, so anyway, it, it just depends on the vendor. It's probably the best thing. Uh, any more questions? Yeah. Is it any of this wasn't scary enough? You're also going to frustrate a lot of IR handlers, and forensic analysts, and good targeting in that devices. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, because how do you do for how do you do forensics on that, right? And, and inevitably, your business managers are going to start asking questions that require disallowed forensics right. and terabytes of data. Right. So, repeat it. Repeat the. Uh, okay. So 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 his comment was that you're going to um, frustrate uh, people who are, um, how much should I phrase it? A lot of IR handlers. Yeah, yeah, a lot of IR handlers, handlers forensic analysts, because these devices being firmware based or not real OS based are very difficult to do forensics on. So, 
And again, it's one of those things, particularly if, uh, like talked about the use of it in a virtualized environment, if say we have to take the storage array off to image some piece of it, well, we're not taking down one machine, we're taking down 200 machines or 1,000 machines or whatever is reliant on that array. So, um, yeah, so anything else? Oh, oh, okay, uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. So when you're examining these kinds of devices, okay. sort of any specific kinds of operations that you found that break the file sharing functionality? Sure, so, so the question was, is there anything you can do to crash the storage or break functionality? And you shouldn't do it if you're trying to be surreptitious. Exactly, exactly. Um, what I would say is that if you're taking a Metasploit module or some code you found on the internet or something like that to try to run an exploit against the device, then um, be, be careful. <laughs> um, because you can, you know, you, you can crash services. Because again, if it's not real Linux or it's something that's been hacked up to add some functionality in, it doesn't always behave the same way as testing, say it's a Samba exploit, as testing against pure Samba. So those two tend to bring things down. Um, let's see, was there, a, was there a question over here? Yeah. Okay, yeah, hey. Uh, you've been talking about a lot of like, big enterprise kind of stuff. Yeah. You see the same thing in uh, smaller or either home or small business things like the QNASs or uh, Drobo, stuff like that. Okay, yeah. So the question was, um, we've talked about enterprise stuff, but do we see the same sort of things in smaller devices? And the answer is absolutely yes, because really what you see is these operating systems are just written to scale. So I can buy a really small device for under $1,000 and a 10 terabyte device for you know, $5,000, and they're generally running the same firmware or whatever. The only difference is the drive size and number of drives in the array. So um, this, is, this is especially relevant uh, to them. Yeah. So, yeah, go ahead. So this all applies to NAS. Do you find the same sort of things in, in SAN interfaces, or do you not get into SAN at all? Yes, so, that, uh, so the question was, that does, do SAN interfaces typically have the same sort of uh, issues? And it, well, really, the answer is it depends on whether they're being sort of dual-purpose, uh, you know, NAS and SAN devices. We're using some direct attached storage, but you're also taking other interfaces and plugging them in, exposing other types of services on. So, uh, yeah, it is relevant to SAN as well. Um, let's see. Does anybody have anything else? Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Russell. Um, well, what were we going to say now? You've got a piece of paper with like, stuff on it. Uh, the beer is ending. I don't, is there any more cups of beer already poured? Or, no, we're pretty much done with the beer. But there will be more free drinks tonight. Uh, so tonight at 7.30 at the Havana Cigar Club. It's $10 uh, to get in to get uh, a free cigar, uh, free food, well, $10 worth of cigar and food. And uh, there will be an open bar for uh, a limited time as well during that event. So uh, we put some of our sponsorship money to uh, put on the party for all of you. And uh, the Havana Cigar Club just opened. That's actually where Devin works. So they kindly uh, provided us some help to uh, bartending. Thank you, Devin. <laughs> and, uh, they've been open for about six months. And they've got the best ventilation system on the planet. And then Allison's not a cigar smoker. She was there last week. What did you think of it, Allison? Yeah, I mean, she said she said Jack smelled way worse than the cigars. Um, so yeah, stay in your ventilation system. So you're not at the smoke and come. We'll hang out, have uh, a few beers and uh, some food. So uh, again, if anyone needs transportation, we're getting a few of you to that event. Um, so if you do need transportation, come find someone in a white shirt, and we'll try and get you there. So Adrian's raising his hand. So uh, find someone in a white shirt before you leave. To give you a ride. Uh, and you've got a whole list of stuff. Just a couple more things. Tomorrow we are not back here. As Mike mentioned earlier, we're at 170 Hope Street, which is Paris and Holly at Hope Brown University. Check in will start at 8.15, and we're going to start at 9 o'clock with a couple great talks. First, we get Josh Wright talking about how to mess with your neighbors who use your own Wi Fi. And we also have Alice Nixon and Brandon Levine. <laughs> talking about messing with the booters and stressors and some of the fun research that they've done. I also need to remind you that this can't happen without our sponsors. We want to thank all of our sponsors. Black Hills InfoSec, GuidePoint Security, Application Security Inc., Tenable, all that comes. 
ISACA Rhode Island, Sync Corporation, and here we have Beta Spring. We also want to thank Stephanie Caress, who's been around. And a quick thank you to our speakers today, Charlie Erickson, Jim Peeler, James Edge, Russell Vinnerini. Uh, we also want to thank Adrian for doing our videos. Believe it or not, the talks from today are already online. So well, two of them. I'm working on his friend at about, and you know, I'm working on it. Paul's broke the computer or something like that. So. Uh, so we also want to thank the volunteers, all the people who volunteered to help, and also all the help from Roy and from Mike. Thank you for their help, and thank you to Devin for pouring here.